would you please take this time? Yeah, clap unto the Lord. That's right. Would you take this time to greet one another? Greet somebody new. Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Free, therefore, keep standing firm, and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. I just want you to take a second and sit there as we start this song. I'll ask you to stand, but I want you to just close your eyes for a minute, and just really, this is a very simple song, but it's very powerful words.
bless your name, Jesus. You are so worthy to be praised, to be honored and glorified. Hallelujah. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no to be honored, to be glorified. 
in this congregation and around the world in the heavenlies. You are the one true living God. And we get to be loved by you. We get to be freed by you through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us, for dying on that cross, for conquering death, hell, and the grave so that we may be able to live with you for eternity, to have abundant life on this earth and to have an amazing forever, a forever, forever. Eternity is forever. May our hearts and our minds be focused on that. Lord Jesus, unify our hearts as one body. OCC here, Operation Christmas Child. I just want to say I, I found someone else who received a box when they were younger that comes here. And uh, I'm impressed with that, that our people have been influenced by Operation Christmas Child. These boxes are a significant gift to little ones who don't get gifts. And they realize it's free. It's free. They didn't do anything to deserve it. They just got it. And so pray for these boxes as they go out. And I know that I came in yesterday and there was a big packing party going on yesterday. Could uh, those who were involved in the party, whether you brought toys or you packed the boxes or whatever, could you just stand up and we'll just say thank you who were involved in that? There's a bunch of them uh, upstairs. Also, uh, as you know, this past uh, Tuesday, we had an election. And I think we all kind of feel, I'm glad it's over, <laughs> so we can move on. But we had, this was a polling place, and we opened the doors and welcomed our neighborhood in. And it was really a fun day here for anybody who came in here. Uh, people were voting, they were happy. Uh, we provided the workers lunch and we provided free uh, beverages and food out in the cafe for whoever wanted. And uh, many people stopped in and, and sat and talked and laughed and discussed and um, talked with each other. And it was a, a party atmosphere, I guess, is what I would call it. But it was us welcoming our neighbors as a neighbor. And I just want to, could those, all those who are involved either in bringing things or moving chairs here, I know a bunch of you had to move chairs and uh, but then reset the chairs and uh, greet people when they come in and provided um, material to eat. Can, can you all stand up, please, those who were involved in that process today? Okay. Thank you. I've. Uh, <coughs> For our little faith story this morning, I thought it would be good to have Dave come up. Dave, you want to come up, please? You are. Come on. <coughs> Dave is uh, my friend for many years. Uh, watched him grow up and get married and have kids and all these things. But he has a uh, secret. <laughs> um, what's your secret, Dave? I'm, I'm the chairman of the Republican Party in Vermont. Of Vermont. Mm -hmm. So you, ha you have some friends. Now, there's others who voted 50, 50. other ways, and that's, that's okay, too. We're going to talk. I guess what I wanted to say is, can you give us a perspective? I mean, you're a, a born-again Christian. You love Jesus, and you're conservative, and you happen to be a Republican. Um, What's a perspective on this pretty intense election that we just had? What, give a perspective, a Christian perspective on that. Well, I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of people struggled. I think even early on uh, through primaries in the general election with, you know, what would God have me do? You know, what should I do? What would God have me do? How can I vote my conscience? And you know, there's um, uh, sometimes there's more or less clarity than you would like. And um, so, you know, I think by being attentive, by uh, listening, by, uh, uh, you know, watching not only what's reported in the media, but also the little signals that come from candidates is an important thing to, uh, to be aware of. And uh, eventually, you know, as Americans, we're blessed with the ability to check the box and cast our ballot and, uh, and, and vote for who we think is the best. You, you mentioned uh, that in America we do it different than in other countries when we transition power. What was your statement? Well, it, it, it's very true. Uh, I mean, in, in many countries, the transition of power happens through bullets, and in America, it happens through ballots, and that's a great thing. 
And, and I know. think when you discuss with other people, I think that's really a great word to say. It's it's ballots, not bullets. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's actually kind of a Christian way almost, you know, to say uh, we realize there's something bigger than us. So what is our response now? I mean, we've made it through that one step, but now there's many steps ahead. How do we as Christians respond to government and this kind of thing? What, what's our role? Well, I think the first, the most important thing is to remember that God is sovereign. And the God of Abraham and Isaac and the God of November 7th, 2016, is the same God of November 8th and November 9th and today and in the future. He's on his throne. He knows what's happening, and it's not a mistake. Uh, and our, but our role as citizens, I mean, we live in a blessed country. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm thankful I was born in America. I'm thankful I was born in Vermont. Uh, and we have the ability to speak out, which many people in many countries don't. Um, we need to speak out. If we want change, uh, we need to speak out respectfully and, uh, and understand that the uh, leaders of our country are appointed and uh, appointed by God. And, um, but, we, we, but we can speak out and we can be involved and work for change that where we want to see change. And I encourage people to do that. So even if you don't agree with everything, you can still have a voice. And you can still be true to who you are, but do it with respect. Absolutely. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. But that's a, that's a blessing of being an American. Yeah. There's a, a couple of verses I want to stay here, Dave. Okay. There's a couple of verses I just wanted to read here in the context that you may want to have in your pocket when you talk with people. One is uh, Romans 13, which I thought is a very uh, interesting perspective. Just listen to this. Romans 13, 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The, the authorities that exist have been established by God. Therefore, or consequently, he who rebels against the authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment. For uh, rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but only for those who do wrong. And I think it's just the concept of, is that we do it with respect, and uh, authority comes from God, and he just happens to establish the rulers. And the other one is in uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. And so we, especially as Christians, uh, need to pray for those who are in authority. And that has to do with law enforcement, that has to do with teachers, that has to do with pastors, elders, all sorts of things that we as a church need to pray for them. Um, I know just before the election uh, that Franklin Graham mm -hmm. had a prayer meeting. I don't, I don't know if you were aware of that, but yeah, yeah. and my wife was online and she saw our son Josh get on. He's in Savannah and then a friend of ours get on for this prayer service. Um, they were from uh, Elmhurst, Illinois. So it's just, I think Franklin Graham actually had a lot to do with the evangelical vote anyway, of actually getting out there and voting. So he didn't say who to vote for, he said vote. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the numbers are, there'll be data crunching going on for weeks or, or months to figure out exactly why such an unpredicted outcome uh, came about. But uh, the evangelical vote, uh, at least from the early numbers, looks like it was substantially higher than it had been in the last... Yeah a few election cycles yeah. and uh, you know who knows uh, what, what how much of that was an impact of yeah. Franklin Graham but certainly some of it well I just want to say for in behalf of our church here that we are, are proud of you Dave mm -hmm. for standing up as a Christian mm -hmm. to make your voice be heard and to provide leadership in a time in our country when we really need it mm -hmm. so we just want to say thank you thank you very much Take your Bibles, please, and turn to John chapter 3. This was, uh, in your notes, I have a statement that, was, that my wife saw. I don't know if it was on a... Where did you see this particular statement? Was it on a sign out for a church or was it on Facebook? Where, where did you see this? It's in your notes. It says, I'm not trusting in an elephant or a donkey to save me, but, I'm, but in a lamb who died and, ta and takes away the sin of the world. 
It was, on, it was a placard out in front of a church. And at first I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. But the more I thought about it, the more I couldn't shake it, is that we aren't really depending on the government to save us. We're really depending on Jesus. And I think we as Christians, it's, it's a time now to stand up and say what we got to say and actually be involved where we need to be involved. And it's time. Today is an interesting day, a passage uh, that I'm going to speak on. It is the most often quoted verse in the Bible, John 3.16. And it is a powerful verse loaded with truth, and I think we need to uh, focus on it this morning and uh, see what God would have to say about this. So, <clears throat> those of you who, how many of you learned it in King James? Okay, can we just uh, quote this uh, verse together? John 3, 6, so we're going to quote the reference and the verse and then the reference. So, all those of you who know it, it's not on this text. I, that's NIV text, so it's going to be different. Okay, let's do it together. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. Now, many of the kids uh, would be able to shout that one right out, too. And many of you, that was one of your first verses when you became a Christian. But I want to say there's some real superior things. There's, there's some greatest things there. And the first greatest is love, number one. Do we have slides this morning? There we go. Love is the greatest motivation. We, we use love a lot in our uh, vocabulary. And if you're on Facebook at all, uh, you see all these things that people love. Uh, they love their job, they love their car, they love their cat, they love uh, their food. But I think most often people put down what they're eating, and I, I, find, I find that somewhat humorous, but also that's their focus. And there, you put a picture of a food or a pizza or something that you're eating, and everyone makes a comment on it. You talk about Jesus and everything is quiet, and it's like, what is this, you know? But it's just kind of our culture is in our values. And so I think the word love has been diminished in our culture. It is not as uh, beautiful and sweet as God made it. Jesus said that he so loved the world. This was not like I love my meal, love. It was a selfless, it's called agape. It's God-focused. It is other-centered it is pure, it is righteous, it is not expecting anything in return. It is a, an amazing love. And God didn't love just those who are beautiful and smart and strong and all those things. It wasn't because of who they were. It was because of who God is. He loved us in spite of us, believe it or not. Romans 5.8 but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners or while we're enemies with God, he died for us. That's, a, that's, pre, that's pretty strong words there. And I think that we, when we talk about love, God loved us in spite of ourselves. God so loved the world. The world is cosmos. We get the concept of cosmopolitan, uh, cosmonaut, and cosmetics. It's actually, the word means it's arranged in order. And actually the definition for cosmetic is to uh, arrange in order or to correct. Here's, here's one of the definitions. To correct the defects of the face is what cosmetic is. <laughs> but it's this kind of thing of putting things in order and making them work. And God says, I love the world. And God created the world that we see, but then there's people in it, and he loved them too. God so loved the world that 
that he gave. So the second is Jesus is the greatest gift. The greatest gift possible is Jesus. And in King James it says only begotten. It really means his one and only. So when God the Father said there's a dilemma that's going to happen on earth, he looked around and said, who can go fix this mess that's coming? And Jesus raised his hand. He says, I will go. We don't have that discussion. I know as a father, I would say, okay, wait a minute. Let's see if there's another plan here. But God, in his eternal love for mankind, for you and me, he said, I will take my one and only son, and I will give him to you. And I think that's uh, an amazing thing. It says in our text here, verse 17, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, for whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what he has done has been done through God. This whole concept of light and belief Believing is not just believing in a historical Jesus or believing in a miracle worker. It's not just intellectual assent or having an experience. It's believing and trusting in Christ alone to save us. There is no other. You can't make it better. It's just you with God. When I was dating my wife, in the uh, 70s, actually. I lived in New Hampshire, and she lived in Illinois. And I wanted to show my great love for her. And so uh, one day I was, I was walking outside of my apartment, and there was a rose bush there. And the rose bush, uh, I had been watching it form, but th these roses were getting ready to pop. And there was seven of them in a grouping of this rose bush. And I thought, well, seven being the perfect number, seven. Uh, I went out and I clipped that, and I put it in a box, and I sent it to her. The problem was, is I didn't put anything on the stem of the rose, and so in that week that they, to get there, they dried up. And so, you know, a week later, she gets this box, and there's, she's shaking it, you know? And it feels like there's nothing, nothing in it because it had dried up. And <clears throat> she opens it, and there's a little rose stem with seven little buds. I think one had actually popped open, and those petals were now in the, in the bottom of the box because she'd shaken the box, to, thinking, what did he send me, nothing? And uh, <clears throat> I think she was looking for a ring is what she was looking for, and it didn't <laughs> jingle at all. So uh, there was, she opened up, and there was this uh, rose cluster. So that was that. And we talked about it, and we, we laughed and whatnot. So shortly thereafter, I get a gift in the mail uh, from someone, and I, uh, I could smell it. And it smelled terrible. Before I could open it, I could smell it, and I, I thought, what is this? And so I open it up, and inside was an octopus leg. And it was uh, moldy and smelly and slimy, and with suction cups still on it. And uh, I checked the reference, like, who sent me this? You know, who would send me? And it was my dear, <clears throat> soon to be wife. And I thought, what, what were you th thinking? Because it was during the Labor Day weekend. It happened to be really hot that weekend. And it just, it, it, it didn't go, go well. And, uh, oh, she said, well, we had, we're having a party. And uh, one of the 
folks had uh, bought a little octopus, and I guess the goal was you break off octopus legs and you dip them in something and you eat them. I, I don't know what it. I've never heard of anyone cooking octopus before. Anyway, so she said, I thought it'd be fun for you just to see this. I said, well, I saw it, and uh, <laughs> I had to bury it because uh, they wouldn't even take the garbage, you know, at that point. Anyway, so we laughed about that, and after that, I made uh, this particular memory box, and um, I bought a miter box and everything to cut the angles, and, you know, the engineer in me had to do this. So <clears throat> I want to say one more thing, is the roses are down here, right there. They're the only, only, I guess only the center one opened up. And uh, so the other ones are still there. They're dried, and they will never change now. But the concept is there. And secondly, the octopus leg didn't make it in here. <laughs> so <clears throat> this was my attempt to give a gift to my soon-to-be wife because I loved her. Now, later on, what she really wanted was the ring uh, to show that, which um, these are other pictures and things that have to do with us. But when God wanted to give us a great gift, he sent the best. It wasn't just flowers. It certainly was not an octopus leg. It was his son who loved us with an everlasting, eternal, selfless, dynamic, life-changing love. And I want you to realize that whether or not you're a Christian is that God loves you in spite of you. And it's not because you're beautiful or handsome or have money or power or whatever it is. It has nothing to do with that. It's because Mankind is created in the image of God. And he says, I love you. And I'm going to do something about that. So in John 3.16, when God so loved the world, he loved the world that he gave. He gave something very significant. That whoever believes... I like the word whosoever. And I think that's the best part of this whole deal. When God was making this gift for the world, he didn't just say that this and this and this and this. He said, he said, whoever believes. Now, there is a big theological question that we could sit here and debate. And theological schools debate this whole thing and Jacob would love to discuss this, I'm sure. <laughs> Whoever is our greatest opportunity. Whoever is our greatest opportunity. Did God choose me? Or did I choose God? Am I destined to become a Christian? Or did I have a choice in it? There's a lot of debate that goes on that. And here is the simplest illustration I can give you that is so simple it's profound and it, it's, I get it. Who's, who's in charge here? Doesn't it say here, though, that whoever believes in whoever? You know what, gang? I'm a whoever. And each one of you is a whoever. So it says whoever believes. That covers us all, right? Whoever. So here's, here's my view. So we come to heaven. Let's say heaven is behind me here. And there's this gate. And over the gate is a banner. Okay? And it says, whosoever will may come. Off these verses here. Whosoever. So the call goes on and says, whosoever will believe in the Son is welcome. Remember the Bible also says, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. But at this point, he's saying, whoever, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So <clears throat> when we're coming toward heaven, the banner says, whoever. You go inside the gate, 
And now you're looking back at the gate that you just walked into. It says, chosen from the foundation of the world. Chosen from the foundation of the world. Well, I, yeah, but God picked me, you mean? I put this, it was such a great verse, Ephesians chapter 1. You, you must go there and you must highlight this. Ephesians chapter 1. It's highlighted in my Bible. Verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. When did he choose us? Before the creation of the world. Before you even, you weren't here. You weren't a glimmer in anybody's eyes. There was nothing here. There was no people on earth when he chose us. You say, well, how can he do that? Well, he's God. No problem for God. He chose us before the creation of the world. Watch this. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So in love, he chose us. Same co concept of love that we're talking about here. He chose us to be adopted as sons. So for me, it's not a problem that I chose on my own free will at the age of nine, April 9th. It was my free will that did that. No one forced me to do that. I chose. However, once I make that choice, I realize there's more to it than I know. The Spirit of God was working inside my spirit to say, I will respond to the gospel because God chose me. It's two sides of the same concept. So I chose and God chose. It worked out. And for you who are Christians, it should be not a problem for you that God chose you before you knew about it, but then you responded. That's no problem. And for those of you who are maybe wrestling with that, wrestle with it. But realize that God loved you, and he died for you. And if you respond, then you realize that you, he already chose you. Finally, number four. So we have love is the greatest motivation. Jesus is the greatest gift. Whoever is the greatest opportunity. And number four, eternal life is the greatest future. Eternal life is an amazing gift. How do you measure eternity? Eternity goes on forever. As a mathematician, there's a start and an end, but in forever... It just keeps going. It's, it's hard for me to fathom, but not God. There is no time with God. A thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years. There is no more time anymore. We just live with God. He talks about the light here in John chapter 1. And he says, who has the light? And it's interesting, light and dark are talked all the way through the book of John. And Jesus is the light of the world. And when Nicodemus came, who's one of the rulers in uh, the ruling uh, group there in Israel, he came at night. And so there's this image of light and dark all the way through the gospel here. And in this particular case, it says this. In John chapter 1, verse 9, the true light, meaning Christ, gives light to every man. Every man, woman, or child has some light given to them. And it depends how we respond to that light. But every person is given some light. And he gives us the, the responsibility to share light with others. But he gives light to every man. Then he says here, man doesn't respond always that well to light because his deeds are evil and he wants to hide them thinking that he can hide from God. So he doesn't want to bring his evil deeds out into the light because God will see them. Does that sound like anyone in the Old Testament that you might have read about? 
Adam and Eve. Remember, Adam and Eve had sinned. They had eaten of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. And then God was walking in the garden to just, as he did normally with them, and they were hiding, and they put fig leaves on themselves to cover them up because they knew they had done something wrong. And they didn't want to be exposed. And so God ultimately talks to them, and there was some punishment in their particular case, and we are feeling the results of that, that sin entered into the world and all that. But then God graciously covered them with animal skins, and blood was shed at that point. It's an amazing story. You have to make a choice. Are you going to live in light or dark? And when people are sinners, they know about they know it. They may not admit it, but they know it. And people are slaves to sin. And they have bondage, and they go back, and they carry these backpacks, and they drag their chain, and they're caught in bondage. And I'm saying, let it go. Let go of that bondage. But bring it to the cross, and Christ will break the chains that are keeping you captive. He'll break those chains, whatever they are. It's an awesome privilege to believe in a sovereign, almighty God. And so for some of you who may be struggling this morning and say, yeah, but God can't ever accept me because I've done this and this and this and this. Or this happened to me, God could never accept me. I'm saying you're in chains and you need to let go. And bring them to God and say, I'm bringing my chains. I'm in bondage. Set me free. And you have to repent. The Bible says, humble yourselves under an almighty God and he will lift you up. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Come to God with your chains and he'll set you free because he's a chain breaker. That's what the cross did. So my comment to you is if you have never accepted Christ and you feel that you can't because you just aren't good enough, I have some good news. You can't be good enough. You can't be good enough because there's only one who is good enough. And that's the chain breaker, Jesus. And so what you need to do, in just a moment we're going to pray, but you need to say, Lord Jesus, I come with my chains. I'm in bondage. I cannot get out of it. I've tried. It doesn't work. But I believe that you died on the cross for me. You died, you were buried, and you were raised again. And one day you'll come back for me. I believe that. And then what does it say here in this verse? Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but who does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. But if you believe, you're set free. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your unbelievable gift, Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness of sin. We thank you that you take his chains and all. But that's who you are, is you're a chain breaker. And I pray for anyone this morning that they would say, Lord Jesus, I admit today that I'm a sinner. I have no right to the kingdom. But I believe that you died for me this day. 2,000 years ago. I believe in what you did for me. I ask you to forgive of my sin, forgive me of my sin and set me free. And I give my life wholeheartedly to you. Because from now on, I want to be a slave for God. In Christ's name, amen. amen. What a wonderful sermon about the love of God and how he can break every chain in our lives. I think the whole service has just been about us being more aware of who we are in Christ, of the, the bondage that he can break in our lives. We don't have to be in bondage anymore. We can be set free. We're going to sing this song. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Oh, that's beautiful.
beautiful congregation. Of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. longer a slave. You are a child of God. Get that into your heart today. 